Hey guys, welcome back to North. My guest today is Leslie De La Vega. She's a photo editor at the New York Times, and she's also worked for Rolling Stone, Fast Company, Essence, Time, Fortune, Teen People, and Vibe, as well as a startup called Ozzy.com. Needless to say, she knows what she's talking about, and that's really why I wanted to get her on the show today. I want to pick her brain about what goes into the world of photo editing, how everything comes together uh, in editorial outlets, whether that's in print or online, and sort of what is expected of photographers and those looking to get into this world of uh, creating. So um, I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as I did. I had a great time talking with her. As always, uh, she's just super friendly and full of information and uh, really appreciates photography. And, and she herself is an avid shooter. So make sure to check out her work on her Instagram. I will put that in the show notes. It's just leslie.delavega on Instagram. And uh, hopefully you dig this as much as I did. So without further ado, please enjoy my talk today with Leslie De La Vega. I am a photo editor, and what I do is I get a story in from the various editors or clients, and they tell me what they'd like, what the story is about, or what their project is, and they would like me to figure out visually how we can represent that. So whether it's usually hiring photographers, uh, lately it's it's becoming a little bit of hiring uh, photographers who do video. But not a lot of video, just enough for video loops. Hmm. But mostly it's hiring photographers who can execute this vision. And then I assign it to them. I give them my uh, direction. And then they bring it back to me. Uh, I usually prefer a wide edit. And then I narrow it down. And then I submit this either to the client or I put it – right now I'm at the New York Times. And so what I do is – I edit it based on what the story text-wise looks like, and then I produce it online in um, our CMS uh, with what visuals I think works best for the story. So you mentioned you're with the New York Times. Are they, or the writers that are working on a certain piece, are they coming to you solely and saying, Leslie, we need you to execute this idea from a visual standpoint, or are you sort of the captain of a team, we'll call it, where you're working with a bunch of other people and you're all sort of pulling your resources to bring together this sort of visual thing into a cohesive piece that you're going to then whittle down. Sure. So it's it's for every place that I've been to, it's been very different. Uh, for here, for the New York Times um, specifically, um, just not to break this down, but I'm going to break it down so that you and the reader or the listener understands. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get a, an email to the group of photo editors. So there's one email that goes out to the three photo editors on this desk, which is the business desk. The editor of the reporter sends a, an email to one email address, and it goes to the three photo editors. And it tells us what the story is, who we need to shoot, just general logistical information with a brief of the story. All the reporters and the editors are divided amongst the three photo editors. So depending on who that um, email is from, let's just say it's from Bill Brink who handles retail, Mm. then that story, I know that I would have to pick up that story. Bill Brink sends it, sends us an email, yep. and I notice that he's my editor, so every all the other photo editors on the email know that that's my guy, my beat. Mm-hmm. So I will take it, I will read the story, and then I will discuss either the idea uh, or brainstorm with the editor, the writer, and our uh, sometimes our deputy um, digital editor for the biz desk. Um, but what's great about the New York Times is unlike any place I've ever worked for, is that visuals and photography is paramount. <laughs> Michelle McNally has done such a superb and wonderful job. We've won so many awards. Yep. So what's great is that basically the photo editor has the opportunity to decide what they would like to do, who they would like to use, the kind of visuals they would like to to um, implement. So for instance, I received a story recently that was we were doing wind turbines in um, Denmark. <laughs> and so my the, the editor of the biz desk said we really would like to make this visual so i thought okay so how are we going to do this so apparently it's one of the big they, they create they build one of the biggest wind turbines in the world <laughs> so i thought we have the opportunity to visit the factory 
uh, an actual working wind turbine. So what can we do? So I hired a photographer who does a beautiful job named Karsten Snezhbaum. I don't even know if I'm saying that right because it's, Dan- it's Danish. <laughs> anyway, and then I also knew how wonderful would it be to get drone photography to fly in the interior of the factory oh. and just go from one end to the other to see the production and the, the scale of these, yeah. these turbines. Uh, and then also do drone photography uh, at a working turbine. So the, the turbine is face-to-face with the drone. A man or a, a woman is coming out of a doorway and you can see the scale. And so it, it just worked out really well. Oh. And I, the, the idea – and so I discussed that with my editor – and the writer, and then we, and then the PR person for Siemens, who is the wind turbine manufacturer. Okay. And it happened about three days ago. But it was a, a little bit of you know um, prepping and and producing. But it was amazing that you know they they rely and they trust the photo editor, the visuals editor, to create something uh, to represent a story and make it wonderfully beautiful. I mean that that's actually a term i can use wonderfully beautiful <laughs> to make it beautiful checks out. yeah yeah <laughs> they actually represent what the text is all about um and when i spoke to the editor that we had we had shot it i asked her how do you do you have a draft how do you want me to do this how do you want me to lay it out and she says well we, what we'd like to do is base the text on the visuals so why don't you go ahead and wow. produce the story online and then we'll work the, the words around the video, visuals. I can send you an example of something that's very similar to this that I did um, that worked out really beautifully. That sounds awesome. Okay. And I, I heard you mention, obviously, the drone stuff in there as well as um, you've been utilizing some video stuff. How much of, I guess, other than, you know, handheld shots, we'll say, um, just standard photos are you starting to implement as far as different technologies, whether it's stuff with drones or some B-roll video stuff to accompany some of the stills. I imagine all this stuff is starting to sort of, you know, get worked into the fabric of what you're putting out there. It is. And I want to say a good, this might be from, um, from my point, it's probably a good 80% or more of the stories that I assign on my desk I have to think differently so it's more than just stills it's what can we do that are video loops uh are there any 360s involved is there drone photography are there gifs involved we have to implement all these other assets or multimedia pieces um pieces multimedia assets Mm. um, to make something more than just stills and sometimes a, a, a lot of times but a lot of times stills will do the job. Yeah. But more often than not, we are now including all these different moving pieces. Are you getting, that's, that's our thought process. Are you getting these different moving pieces? Um, <clears throat> are you looking for photographers that are able to do numerous, you know, they can do drone, they can do video, they can do stills. Are you looking for that to all come from the same person or are you going, Hey, we need a drone guy and a video guy and a stills guy. It, originally, when I did the semen piece, I thought I can hire a drone photographer and a still photographer in one. But when I realized that I would I would sacrifice the quality because this this person would have to cover both uh, both aspects. Uh, a, thank you. Yeah. Would have to cover <laughs> both aspects uh, and and dedicate their time to both of them equally. That would be impossible because. I, I feel like they would have to be running around and we don't have a lot of time and I didn't want to sacrifice the quality. Yeah. So instead of just hiring one person to do both, I hired two different um, shooters. <laughs> but it also – it really just depends on the story, Chip. So if this is something that both a photographer can do, then yes, if it, he has enough time to dedicate to it and he's not sacrificing the quality. But if it's something where I feel like I really want to get some really good pieces without having them to struggle and run around, then I will sh- go ahead and hire a videographer, uh, a drone photographer, and a stills. That's so refreshing to hear because I feel like more often than not, it's the opposite where they go, hey, we need you to get these 10 different things all at the same time. And like you said, the, sometimes the quality afterward, it's like – had I had a little more time to do each of these, you know, they would have exactly. come out. It's like, 
you're sacrificing quality across the board by trying to squeeze too many things onto the plate sometimes. So. Exactly, exactly. And and if a photographer tells me, like for instance, I had a photographer tell me, you know, I can't, I can't. It was um, another coincidentally enough another drone story in um, China. Um, and I asked the photographer to shoot drone and to shoot stills. And he told me, um, and I wasn't sure about, you know, the workload because I, I only had specific piece, uh, still photography in mind. So I thought, Oh, he can also do drone, but he told me that he didn't think he was able to do both and give me a hundred percent. So I said, that was fine. He can mm-hmm. focus on stills and I will hire a drone photographer. I'll try to find a drone photographer to, to shoot the drone footage. And you were hiring someone local. In yes. China, or you were sending people in China, okay. local in China. Okay, so going back a little bit, sort of, um, I guess going back to the beginning of all of this, how did you personally get into photography, which I am assuming then led you down the road of possibly working for publications, and then yes, you know, starting to shoot for publications, and then becoming a photo editor. Where did this all? Began for you? Did you grow up shooting stuff? Did you get into it in uh, college? Yeah, so, so it actually started when I was six years old. I was uh, I was with my aunt, and she had brought me. She bought us two ferry tickets to go. I, I lived in San Francisco, and she bought two ferry tickets to go under the Golden Gate Bridge, huh. and then back. And when I was six, so we went out, and she lent me her Kodak Instamatic, <laughs> and so we were she had given it to me to, to borrow. And while we were under, I was just shooting these photos. And when she developed them, I looked at them and I thought, Oh my God. Well, at my, I thought at six years old, these are amazing. Yeah. This is what I want to do. <laughs> so, um, I decided that was what I, I took a little longer than normal to get my bachelor's of arts in photography, but I finally did it. Okay. And, um, where'd you I go to school? San Francisco state university. Cool. Um, and then I thought, you know what, if you, if you can make it anywhere, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. So I applied <laughs> for an internship at Vibe and at the New York Times, hoping that I would be shooting a lot. And I got the inter- internship at Vibe magazine, uh-huh. um, but I really wanted the internship at the New York Times. And so I called the Times and I said, listen, I got this internship at Vibe internship but i'd really like to be at the times <laughs> and they said we can't make that decision right now so i would suggest you take this internship at vibe and i actually am really glad that she said that because i feel like well i'll tell you that story in a second so i got the internship at vibe thinking i was going to shoot covers you know oh my <laughs> god i thought oh this is great covers and features no honestly, yeah the, the was... intern shooting covers right off the yeah. bat <laughs> So I was working with the, the esteemed uh, director of photography, George Pitts, okay. and he actually was an amazing mentor and leader. Uh, he was the person that sort of turned me on to photo editing. Hmm. Um, he had given me these opportunities that you wouldn't get uh, at larger magazines. So he basically had me as an intern go to the cover shoots produce the shoots, be wow. there, be part of the team. And since then I realized this is, I love what I, I love doing this. I love being sort of the glue that puts this all together. And no one, when they look at a magazine and they look at a photo, no one realizes how much work goes behind that photo. Mm-hmm. It's about, you know, uh, production and, you know, uh, catering and hair and makeup and studios and props and all this and all goes into one. And so I fell in love with that. Yeah. Um, and so I just started doing that. I started realizing that I, I really want, I love photo editing. So this is what I'd like to do. Uh, and then every now and then George would let me shoot. He was really great. He let me shoot some, some parts of the, of the magazine. And then my career took off from vibe into several other magazines that have been so different than vibe. And I feel like if I'd gotten the internship at the New York times, I would have stayed in photojournalism. Hmm. I would have, I, I may have just stayed at, at the times forever because I loved it so much. Um, but because I was at vibe, um, from there I was able to go to self magazine from self. I went to premier magazine, premier to teen people, Teen People to Fortune, Fortune to Vibe, Vibe as a director of photography. It's insane. So I made full circle. Yeah. Uh, then from Vibe, I went to um, Time Magazine, 
uh, Essence, Fast Company. Uh, and then after then, I realized – so I was doing print all this time, mm. right? And I was at Fast Company for three and a half years. And at that point, photo editors were – were um, how should I say this? It was hard to get a job because – a lot of people weren't hiring photo editors anymore. I, I, at what? that point, it was at that point where photo editing was a job skill that was not something that was um, – God, how can I say? If needed. Okay. I, what uh, what time was this? Like what sort of time frame as far this as the year? This was 2000, 2012. Okay. When the digital – for me, when the digital age was picking – sort of picking up and – other people were doing photo editing. They had creative directors. They had interns. Other people were, were doing editing digitally. Mm. So, and I was, and I knew that magazines were dying at that point. So I, I was at Fast Company for three and a half years, and I wasn't feeling challenged enough because I knew I was, I knew I was doing what I was doing and knowing how to do it, and there's nothing challenging about it. So I decided that I needed to up my skill level as a photo editor. And I wanted to get into digital. Hmm. And to make a long story short, uh, I was asked by Aussie.com, this startup in um, San Francisco, to come over and meet with them. And and that would mean moving there for a year uh, and uh, just starting from scratch. And I said, you know what? If they're going to take a chance on me and I'm going to learn more, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so from there, I worked for a year at a startup. My first digital, just digital only job, uh, and it was a startup. So it was seven days a week. It's about twelve to fifteen hour days. It was startup life, but it was <laughs> very, very rewarding. Um, and then I left after a year, uh, and I was, I was thankfully I was asked by RollingStone.com to become their to join their team and become the digital director of photography. Yeah. And I feel like I wouldn't have gotten that position if it weren't for Ozzy. Huh. If I had been just a – if I was at Fast Company as a DP for the magazine, print magazine, RollingStone.com would never have considered me, I'm sure. Why do you feel that way? Is it just because one thing – you can sort of look back in hindsight and see one thing sort of leading to the next? Or is it um, the matter the matter of fact that you were working in the digital space already, so it made kind of That's a sensible correct. transition? Yes, and I think they felt like they didn't really have to – didn't have to train me from scratch – I already knew how CMS works at Fast Company. It was a, it's a monthly. Yeah. With Ozzy, it's a daily. It's you know putting out eight stories a day. Uh, that's heavily produced uh, with lots of photography. And I was working with the CMS, and I was working with uh, responsive design, and and doing a lot of tests and mobile tests, and you know all this. It was great. And I think that Rolling Stone recognized that and um, and asked me to come over. And I feel like because of that, because of Rolling Stone and Ozzy. I was asked to join um, the New York Times. So it all comes into – it all has to do with me just up, deciding that I needed to up my skill level. Yeah, I was going to say it sounds like just from the, the sort of the breakdown of your career path thus far, it sounds like the recurring theme I keep sort of picking up on is that you throwing yourself into the fire has proven itself to be very rewarding, both – on a personal level as well as a professional level. It's, it's easy to sort of, uh, I think, be timid uh, about new opportunities or not fully embrace stuff, but it seems like you've, you know, when you've thrown yourself out there and you've sort of jumped off the ledge, it, you've always been uh, better for it. That is, Chip, I can't, you just said it right on the, you nail, right on the nail. <laughs> you said it exactly how it is. You have to... Being a photo editor or as a photographer or at, in whatever you do, yeah. you have to take that chance. Yeah. And the worst that can happen is that you fail. And from that failure, you learn and you push and you move yourself forward. Were you, you, you just try to, to just do the best you can and to be as adventurous, adventurous as you can. Were you ever freaked out when you were sort of – I mean even when you were sort of walking in that first day as the intern at Vibe or when you went – to Aussie in a completely different world, were you kind of freaking out to yourself? Like, what am I doing? Or were you just like fully embracing it and ready to go? Cause I, I feel like when I've 
shot stuff that I'm completely unfamiliar with. I was talking about this with my friend who's a filmmaker in one of the previous podcasts that we were saying it's when we're sort of scared shitless that that seems to be when the most interesting stuff (laughs) happens, you know, and we're like the best, the work we're most proud of versus walking into something we're a little more comfortable with where we sort of, we're happy with the output, but you know, you feel like you grow more professionally when you come out of the fire on the other side. Like, Oh, that's interesting. I, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's, that's in my case. Um, I was, I was embracing it and really excited about it with Ozzy and with being an intern at Vibe because I was excited to learn something new. And I had failed, um, a couple of times at Ozzy as an intern uh, Hmm. at, at certain tasks and there was a creative director at the time there named Dwayne Shaw. At Vibe when you were an intern, you said? Yes, okay, well, I, okay. had, I had done something. I didn't. No one had trained me. They had such a small staff. Yeah. So the creative director had said to me, "I need you to find photos of I. I can't even remember. Let's just say Tupac Shakur. Sure. I need you to find photos of Tupac Shakur." So I pulled like two or three slides. Slides at the time. I pulled two <laughs> or three slides and a couple of photos, and we went to the we went to the um, the light box, and I put it all out, and I had five photos there, and he looks at me and he says this is all you got? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, what do you mean? <laughs> and then I realized at that time that you have to pull lots of images. Hmm. You just don't pull four or five. You don't do like a short, small edit. <laughs> and from that moment on, it, there was more to it in our conversation. But from that point forward, I went above and beyond the Call of Duty to make sure I scoured every possible place to get as many good images as possible. So, um, I actually, it's not that I had embraced failure, but yeah. I think that what I, when I arrived as an intern at Vibe, I was, I was excited to learn new things. And when I failed at that task, it taught me to do how to do it correctly. Yeah. And that's what I was welcoming is the opportunity to learn new things. And, but I know what you mean about being scared. I did a shoot yesterday and I arrived at the shoot because it was raining. It was gloomy. Mm. That the in- interiors were really dark. I only had one strobe with me, and I thought, I'm gonna fuck this up. <laughs> Doomsday you know scenario. What? Yes. <laughs> For a photographer. And then, uh, and then I got back with all my my. I went directly into um, my system and I downloaded the images, and it turned out okay. It turned out pretty good, in fact. So, Exhale. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I did say to the subject, listen, I may have to come back for some retakes, <laughs> but I, it looks like I didn't need to. That's but awesome. But I understand that feeling, too, about being scared and getting there and not knowing, which is also the case at, at times. That's good, though. I feel like when you, um, it's, uh, when you learn to live with that sort of uh, discomfort or that sort of um, uncertainty, I think it's like a great motivator, you know, because you really yeah. sort of up your game and hold yourself to a super high standard. And... Yeah, exactly. When you were interning at Vibe, what year was this exactly? Because I know you mentioned like slides, presumably it was, um, you know, film stuff and everything. I'm just more curious because I'm imagining that sure. when you were working on stuff at Vibe at this time, it was probably when music was at a really cool, interesting place. Oh, yeah. It was huge. It was Vibe was big. Um, Hip hop was really, really strong. It was 2000, 2000 to 2001, I okay. think. Or 2000. Okay. It was 2000. And it was at a time when we would request photos using the telephone. So I'd call Retina. I don't know if you know this agency called Retina. No. And I would call them. I'd say, hey, I'm going to send a messenger to pick up, you know, slides of Biggie. Yeah. And we would have to send a messenger. Messenger would pick up these photos and these <laughs> slides and bring them back. Thank God it's not like that anymore. <laughs> But um, that was that was that was old school way. Did you ever work with a photographer? He's actually a native uh, Clevelander, but he lives in New York and he shoots just the most epic hip hop stuff. Uh, Jonathan Mannion. Yes. Oh man, his work I actually is. Have, he gave me a print. Uh, I ha- I think I have it because I'm getting ready to move. But uh, it's beautiful, beautiful print, and I had it framed. Um, I can't, and it's of boys at a basketball court, and they're all showing their muscle, but they're like young boys. Yeah. Oh, it's great. You know what? I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna send it to you, Chip, so that you can take a look. It's so beautiful. I don't but yes, doubt I've it. Yes, I worked it with Jonathan. 
his work is just so incredible. And so when you mentioned, yeah, when you mentioned Vibe in that time frame, I'm just instantly, I thought, yeah, I bet she's worked with Jonathan Mannion for sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, sort of speaking about photographers that you've worked with and, and how you're finding them, how are you identifying uh, which photographers you're trying to hire and where are you finding them? I mean, I'm assuming Instagram plays a pretty pivotal role. Are you also... You know, I, I always wonder this myself if I'm going to a portfolio meeting or if I'm maybe following someone on Instagram. Is it just really sort of any which way you happen to find someone or do you have like a specific resource? You talk to 10 different photographers, 10 different photo reps. You get 10 different opinions about where right. you should be and what you should be doing and how to promote yourself and all that stuff. Do you have a specific spot where you're like, definitely do this, definitely don't send us another promo? Is it? Are you just sort of open to anything and everything that comes your way? I'm actually the, the type in this day and age, I am so open to anything that mm. comes along. Like I hired photographers that I've, I've met on Instagram. <laughs> uh, and there, as you've read that PD, PDN mm -hmm. online um, interview I did, uh, Nate C. Ward is one of them, and I've been working with him uh, every time I have a shootout in Ohio. Uh, he's wonderful. Uh, he's in also Columbus? Yes. Cool. Uh, and also um, portfolio reviews. Mm -hmm. I've actually taken more. Um, when I was younger and I was doing portfolio reviews, I, I felt like I wasn't – maybe it was because of the talent I was meeting, but I didn't feel like motivated enough to actually – work with these people and I, I can't determine and tell you why I'm mm -hmm. not sure why mm -hmm. but now when I go to a portfolio review I actually really thoughtfully look at their work uh, write down notes I didn't do that before and I would carefully uh, folder the promo cards that they would give me hmm. and the last portfolio review I had um, I had used two people two or three people one of them was Rick Wenner mm -hmm. who I actually met at another portfolio review years ago, which I, um, but his work is really, really evolved. He's done some really beautiful portraiture work. Rick so Winner. I had a, yeah, cool. Rick Winner. I'm gonna find and, uh, I had a, gr I had a very difficult shoot in Jersey. Uh, it was of a CEO in an office, but he took it to another level. Mm -hmm. He really did a beautiful job. Um, so that's one way, portfolio reviews. And there's a lot of actual – there's a, lot, a few other sites that I like to go. I, I want to be more involved in trying to hire more women photographers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a site called Women Photograph. Hmm. Women, I don't know if you've heard of it. No, I haven't. Is it womenphotograph.com? Yes, okay. womenphotograph.com. Cool. It's such a great source. Just because if I have sensitive – Sort not sensitive. Well, sensitive stories in nature. Sure. Um, I, for instance, sexual harassment um, stories. I try to be thoughtful and cognizant of who we're shooting, so I hire female photographers. Yep. Uh, not saying that the male photographers cannot do the exact same job. Sure, sure. But I think this requires a little more um, empathy, I guess. Yep. Uh, so I try to. So I go to women photograph. Um, hmm. Uh, two other sources that I use is uh, Wonderful Machine. Yep. And Redux. Yep. Yeah, Redux. Uh, both. Yes. Yep. So both of those I use when I need someone that I, I can't um, I can't really think of in other in places of the world that I don't have um, anybody there. But what I've also done is I've had a spreadsheet that I've created since I started, which hmm. is. 18 years ago and I was looking at the spreadsheet yesterday and it has various I has a thousand locations with in each of those locations probably two to three hundred photographers wow. a bit on on cities and states and countries oh it's and I can't believe it's so I was thinking god this list is so valuable to me yeah and it's taken such a long time to put it together um and friends of friends okay um, and then lastly, uh, email promos, hmm. email promos. Uh, what about printed promos? Are you getting, well, I'm getting those. So let me back up to that. So I get the printed promos, but I will only, I, my advice to photographers is, and I'm sure they do this already, but sometimes it just, it just doesn't, um, translate well. You, you need to, I think personally, if I were a photographer, I would choose two to three images to print out 
and send an image to the photo editor that best represents that category of work. Okay. So if you're sending me a promo and you're sending me a promo of like baby pictures, yeah, what I'm do, not going to use that. <laughs> what are you going to do with I'm that? Gonna, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to throw it out. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, but if you're sending me a portrait, a very beautiful environmental portrait of a motorcycle mechanic in the midst of his garage, then I will see how well you do in an environment. Uh, then I'll take that and then I'll look, I'll look up the, the photographer on his site mm -hmm. and you know, it's, it's, it's really about being thoughtful about what kind of images your print promos you're sending to a photo editor or a client. Is it something where you're looking for, um, so say you're, say it's the photo editor at Viable, say, does it have to be like, how literal do you think photographers should be with the promos that they're sending and the images that they're choosing? Should it be music related or should it just be a beautiful environmental portrait that can obviously translate into a music setting or a music context? We'll correct. Say? That is correct. It okay. does not, for me, it does not need to be specific. Okay. As long as I can see that you can shoot beautiful environmental portraits, I don't care who the subject is, okay. but if you play into mind the graphic lines, the color, the the framing, then that's all that matters to me. When you're um, reaching out, I know you mentioned Redux. Are you are you when you're reaching out to photographers? Is it sort of half and half between um, reaching out through reps versus reaching out to them directly? Is it just a broad mix, or do you find yourself working with photographers that more often have representation or are completely independent on their own that maybe you found through Instagram? Is it just sort of whatever's appropriate for the story? It's, it's 99.9% .9 reaching out to the photographers on their own. Hmm. So let's, it, it's not often that I find photog that I would need to go into wonderful machine and redux. Okay. Uh, but when I do, I reach, and if I reach out to the photographer directly, I will tell them I got your information from wonderful machine. Mm -hmm. Uh, or I got your information from Redux. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. Hmm. It's usually direct. Uh, it's usually from my list that I have. The New, York, the New York Times has a very, very comprehensive global list, which hmm. is amazing. So we go through there. I mean, I'm very lucky to be working there and having access to these amazing photographers. Um, or I will just do – recently I just did a random search, photographers in – Perth, Australia. Hmm. And I just thought, all right, look, who's there's wedding photographers. And then I just started clicking through the sites. Yeah. And, and, you know, finding people through there. So really, it really is not really through reps or agencies. It's okay. more through the, um, the photographer directly. But the reps I only use not to work with, only use as reference. Okay. Like Wonderful Machine and Redux. So as you're working on a feature or an idea and you've gotten something that has come in, say, um, at the times where it's, you know, a certain subject, is it pretty much mapped out from the beginning and you sort of work backwards uh, from a visual point? Or is it something where it's sort of changing shape and evolving as you start to whittle down what photographers you want to work with and then maybe how they approach it? Is it pretty literal like we need – this kind of photo of this kind of subject and we need you to go execute or is it something where you're saying um here's sort of the idea go do your thing we want you to put your mm -hmm. spin on it and then we'll sort of you know um narrow down from there given the results that you bring back so i want to say the majority of the time it's basically i have a vision in my head mm -hmm. and i try to find a photographer that has the same uh similar aesthetic okay and i will go from there it's rarely where I would say to the photographer, I just need you to do what you do. Um, and I, I only hmm. say rarely because there's only a handful of photographers that I've worked with that are guaranteed. That 100% of the time, I will know I will get something mm -hmm. that is off the hook out of this world. Mm -hmm. And I could name those photographers in both my hands. Maybe less in five. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, hmm. but these are very established photographers who've been around for a very long time. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So, Art Striver. Oh, the man. I mean, I don't have to give him any direction. Yeah. 
I can just say I need a beautiful portrait. Boom, done. That's that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ben Lowy. Okay. Uh, no matter what he's covering, I will get something that's interesting uh, that will be framed beautifully. That will be completely different than what I expected, but will always be a guarantee. Um, another person who's great is John Taggart. Okay. Uh, he's a great street photographer as well. Uh, a lot of times in my on the biz desk, I need exteriors or interiors of like Home Depot. So I've hired a photographer once and I said, I need you to shoot interiors and exteriors of Home Depot. Can you just, you know, shoot some generic shots for me? Yeah. And what I got were basically what looked like traditional point and shoot exteriors interiors of home depot yeah sure but then when i hire someone like john taggart or ben lowey they add something different it's either the framing it's either a uh, movement in the foreground it's graphic lines it's hmm. it's mind-blowing yeah. so it's always a nice surprise so there's only a few that i know who have uh been doing this for quite a while who know uh, what to shoot and how to shoot it, like Art Stryber and Ben Lowy. Yeah. And then, you know, others, other photographers, I think that I just have to give a little direction or mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the, photo the other photographers I've worked with, I can't do this with. I probably could. Um, but I don't do, I don't ask for photography. In 99% of the, the assignments I do, I really just try to have a photographer execute uh, what I'm thinking with their aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, did I just contradict myself? No, I mean, it makes well, sense. It makes it sound like really kind of a pretty collaborative, you know, arrangement between what you're looking for and what the photographer is going to deliver. And, um, yeah. you know, it sounds like there's, it's that nice mix between creative freedom, but, um, you know, it's not so wide open that the photographer is left wondering what they're supposed to be shooting, but right. it's not so right. constricting that they feel like they can't maybe do some of their own thing to it as well. Right. Right. Exactly. Art Strivers, um, He's one of my favorite photographers uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them being because on his Instagram, if you don't follow Art Stryber, I do. If yeah, I mean, I, I'm saying just to the general, you know, the the general public listening, if if they're into photography and they want to see how these epic images sort of come together, he posts so much behind the scenes stuff that I can just, I mean, I geek out on that stuff as much as the finished yeah. product because it's such an education in what he's using as far as equipment and why, and it's just. Uh, it's pretty right. incredible. He's very generous with his information, which yeah. is amazing. I know. I feel like that's a relatively new thing because, you yeah. know, so many guys, I think, like to keep their, their secrets uh, secret. Right, so. right. So right. what's been um, – changing gears a little bit, what's been – if you have any stories that you've worked on through any of these publications you've listed, do you have any that were particularly rewarding or um, challenging? And it can be really – I use those words in sort of the most broad sense as far as rewarding on a personal level or rewarding as far as the attention it might have brought to a specific subject or challenging because logistically it was hard to, you know, yeah. coordinate schedules with a particularly well-known politician or famous person or anything along those lines. Anything stand out to you? Um, I probably have many stories like that, yeah. um, but one recently that comes to mind is uh, a shoot that I did with Johnny Turgo. Uh, so Johnny Turgo is this photographer that I met who uh, is an assistant uh, of Art Stribers. And I met him many years ago. Hmm. And there are two, two times I've worked with him, and each time he has really taken me by surprise. Hmm. So the first one was a story that I did for Rolling Stone where we had to shoot a portrait of a basketball player and it was very difficult to shoot a portrait because we only had seconds with him and we had to shoot him inside his home gym which is <laughs> how exciting could that be <laughs> um and you'll see this on johnny's site he actually shot the portrait of this gentleman i forgive me i can't remember his name yep. but what he did was instead of giving me one image he gave me 12 or so images that I had to put together to create the image. The one. And it's not just like a collage. It's, it was more linear. It was, uh, I, I can't really explain it, but it was very, very refreshing to see him take it to another level. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't use it 
for my purposes online. Okay. It just wasn't it wasn't translating well. So I used a, a portrait, an outtake of that, which was still as beautiful. Sure. But I wish I had been able to use that. Um, and that was one where it was really I was nicely surprised. But an even more complicated shoot uh, was a big project that I assigned Johnny. So we came out. We were coming out with the New York Times very first section. Uh, in out of the business section called um, addiction, hmm. and it was the uh, introduction uh, introductory section with seventeen pages, four stories each Jeez. on the business of addiction, talking about four different stories, three to five subjects each. Anyway, it was a very long process, and Johnny had to shoot so much uh, seventeen pages of his work. Uh, so he had to shoot four or five people per story in addition to locations where people have died, where people have, you know, the rehab centers, yeah. uh, exteriors. Uh, he – that was very challenging because he had to do this in less than two weeks. <laughs> so I had to fly him all the way all over the place in various different cities, uh, meeting with various different peoples. I mean it was – insane wow. it was really insane yeah. uh, I can't even I can't even I'm so thankful he is so easy as he is easy as in he was very chill mm -hmm. uh, when I met him for the very first shoot so the New York Times allowed me to go out and meet him for the very first shoot that was happening in Florida Johnny lives in California Southern California okay. so I had to fly him to Florida Pennsylvania New York Arizona and one other state in two weeks to shoot <laughs> 20 different people all by himself, all with like three or four um, trunks of gear that he brought by himself, that he set up by himself, all of this. And when I met him for the first time, we were at a – I remember meeting him at a cafe before, the day before his first shoot. He brought a binder that was this thick, a black binder. Yeah. And in the black binder were his notes typed up. With each section divided by a divider, and he was it was just amazing to see so yes that was um that was an assignment that I worked in that was very, very challenging and difficult logistically, yeah, but also because of also trying to get people's schedules and trying to get people to be photographed who did not want to be photographed and reshooting people it was just Jeez. it was it was a nightmare. But because of his professionalism and because of his, his easygoingness and his 200% dedica dedication to photography yeah. and the passion of it, it came out by – it took me by surprise. It was supposed to come out a week – like uh, a week in uh, January. Uh, it came out a week before when I was on vacation. I ran to the – I got all these congratulatory emails. I didn't know what the hell anybody was talking about. <laughs> I get to the stands. I open it up and there it is, 17 pages of Johnny's work, all beautiful, and it was just a, such a success. And that's, I mean, that was the, that was the latest. That was two months ago. That's insane, Johnny Turgo. Is it T E R G O? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm gonna find yeah, him. Yeah, definitely. And if you uh, in my Instagram account, you'll see the pages, uh, some of the pages on my on my post. It was a slideshow. He may have it on his site already, but. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And everybody, all the people that worked on this was so pleased with his images. It was just, he took it a dip. So you would normally imagine when people, when, when you assign photographers, it's usually something that's a little more documentary, mm. a little more photo J. He, he did something different where he actually shot, he took a little, he, each, uh, each um, portrait was produced uh, in a way where you know he would do he, he would take gels and strobes and really set it up beautifully. It wasn't just <laughs> let me sit you over here. It's let me sit you over here after I set up all this equipment yeah. for yeah. each portrait. Really gorgeous stuff. And we couldn't even use half of the shit that he shot. And that's presumably a subject that you know it's easy or at least easier to shoot with someone who's at least relatively used to being in front of a camera and relatively comfortable with it. When you're shooting with people that are not at all enthused with being photographed. That's a whole other layer of, you know, so for him to have shot that as successfully as it sounded like he did, I mean, that's, that's yeah. insane. That's just, uh, 
that's hard to wrap my head around. <laughs> no, it really is. He's he's so good with people. Yeah. He is very respectful and uh, just just really an amazing guy. Really, really made this work out. And I picked the right guy for this. Just did a beautiful job. I don't think, and I, I know this because I've talked to other photo editors, I don't think photo editors or clients tell their photographers enough how great a job they do. And I think it's so important that whenever you get a job that you are excited about or happy about, you write them back right away and you say, thank you, you did a great job. Yeah. Because many times I've heard from photographers that they've worked with people where they submit the images and they get no sort of feedback, oh, yeah. either constructive or I'm happy or thank you. And I think that's a bad way to connect with your photographer. I think it's a bad thing to do. And I think it's very important. The only way a photographer will learn um, uh, if you've liked the images or if you don't, or the only way they can improve is or, can, or maintain the, the work that they do is if the photo editor or the client says to them, great fucking job. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's so important. And I can't, and I, the reason why I reiterate this so much is because photographers will write me back and they'll say, um, you don't know how important this was to me. Thank you for taking the time. Like I'll write back a photographer and say, listen, I, you know, I think you did a great job. Um, but I wish you had done this. Mm -hmm. I've asked you to do this, uh, instead of not saying anything at all and then not, never hiring that photographer again, that does justice for no one. Yeah. Especially the photographer. So you need to, as a photo editor, art buyer, you need to give each assignment you do, you have to give that photographer feedback because it's the only way that they'll learn. I couldn't agree more. The, um, I'm happy to, I'm happy to take the rejection. I just can't stand the radio silence. You know, of yes. course, of course, when you hear that you've done a great job, that's always preferred, but I'm happy to hear that I didn't get the job after all versus just complete silence and not knowing where you stand in, in the picture, you know, right. the overall picture. So that's, exactly. uh, yeah, that's, trust me, that's, uh, as you've said, that's as a photographer, that is, uh, more appreciated than, than we can probably put in a word. So, right. Yeah. And I think that if you don't hear from anybody and it might, it might seem scary, but if you don't hear from your client. I think that it would only be smart for the photographer to hit them back and say, hey, I'm just checking in. Did you get the images? Is everything okay? Yeah. Or whatever. But you want to hear. Um, and it, it, the photo editor has to, should respond. How do you sort of define success in either your field or your specific job title? Is it something like that where you – pinpointed the right person for the job they absolutely nail you know nail the job and then some and it's just a resounding feeling of it coming to fruition like you saw it in your head is that sort of the way that you would personally define I guess the word success yes okay. I, I would I would have to say that that if if this person was able if this photographer was able to define what I had in my my head and mm and the vision and actually return with work that that illustrated this vision then yes um that's that's what i find successful if readers especially if readers write and say oh my god this was amazing um this was beautiful work or some other other you know it, it's it means that i'm doing my job correctly mm -hmm. um and you know the photographer is as well it's it's a collaboration, and if it's if it's if it's appreciated by the readers and by my colleagues, then yes, even more so, it feels like it was definitely a success. So, do you have any routines that you're doing um, that make you better at what you do? Whether it's your, I guess, your workflow, or even something as simple as you know, you have a no phone on Sunday rule, or you have, you know, you uh, get up and go for a run in the morning, or you, you know, lights out by nine, anything that you do that <laughs> sort of keeps you sort of uh, at your best? Yes. Um, personally and professionally. So personally, I meditate every day. Hmm. Interesting. Mor so, is that morning or nighttime? Morning. And I know this is, pe people can find this hard to believe, 
morning uh, when I wake up, about 15 minutes, and then when I'm in the train when I come home, huh. so in the subway. And yeah. people often wonder, how do you do that? But I think it's easier to do it in a train than it is at home when it's very quiet. And that's because you have to focus mind- – when you focus from mindfulness, you sort of have to be in the present. And being in the train and closing my eyes and listening to the various conversations or the noises or the trains, that takes me there. I am current, I am present, and that's it. So that's a great – and that keeps my attitude really, uh, you know, uh, positive. Yep. Meditating gives gives me uh, thinking that the whole day the the glass is half full (laughs) and that um, I just have a better attitude. Uh, And then another thing professionally – that I do, which is really important, I think, for anybody who's a photo editor or an art buyer, is to constantly look through magazines, look through uh, other publications, see who, who are they using, what are they doing. Like for a while, I was keeping trunk.com on my home. I have three monitors at work, and for a while, I was keeping the trunk um, homepage up on one of the monitors just so that I could see what was flashing, the work that was flashing from okay. trunk. trunk okay. So basically just hmm. trying to discover new photographers uh, and new new visual artists. Hmm. Just constant sort of uh, feed of information as far as seeing new stuff come in and, and yes. staying open to whatever. Yes, yes okay. and, it could, and it could generate ideas yep. for stories or if I see something that a photographer does and I'm working on something that's kind of similar and I would like that treatment, wow. I'll hire this guy. Uh, but it also keeps your mind fresh and your work fresh. Yeah. You know, trying to not work with the same artists all the time, but keep it moving. Sure. You know, and, and also giving the opportunity to people who haven't been photographing or d- d- doesn't. I just hired someone recently who's a wedding photographer in California. <laughs> um, and we have photographers in California, but I discovered this person and her name is Alpana. I'm not I'm probably butchering her name because I can't say it correctly. Alpana Aras King. Okay. And she does beautiful work, but it's more like portraits for family. Sure. Uh, couples. Um, and then I hired to do this portrait for me, and she did a beautiful job. That's awesome. So, yeah. It's just trying to get photographers who, who also aren't established in the editorial world, you know, and having them – it's good for them. Yeah. And it's it's – and, and it's also the the opportunity to work with someone who is thinking, oh my god, I'm working for the New York Times. I'm really gonna, I'm really gonna, you know, kick it out of the, or hit it, hit it out of the park, whatever the cliche. Yeah, is. yeah. Uh, so it's nice to to see that attitude and that that perspective. Yeah, was she excited to? I mean, I imagine if she doesn't usually shoot editorial stuff, and she gets a call from the New York Times, she must have been freaking out, you know. I think she. I I want to say she was because I left her message. I got a, a, a call right away, and <laughs> it was very nice to hear her voice. And she seemed like she was really excited about it. And she was so thankful via email, and it was it was very nice to, to hear. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, seeing this stream of images come in, it might inspire you to sort of take on a story idea. Is it something where, and whether it's at New York Times specifically or elsewhere, is it something where it's a bit of a two-way street between – the photo editor saying, hey, I have an idea for a story. Can we write something around it? Or is it sort of more of a one-way street where they're saying, hey, we're working on a story about this and we need you to find visual assets for it? Is it, is it both ways? It's, it's both ways. Okay. And, um, but it's, I think that I want to say that the New York Times, I can't say it enough, mm-hmm. has really photography is paramount and is equal to the written word. Hmm. Um, so whenever, whenever a photographer, uh, sorry, a photo editor or a photographer has an idea that we pitch, uh, normally it's a go. Normally we can do it. Hmm. And each desk is, is not micromanaged. Each desk, uh, is like their own little magazine. Okay. And for instance, if my colleague uh, wants to do a story on AI in China and she has some great visuals, uh, and we want to put it inside the magazine. Uh, I'm sorry, inside our section. Mm-hmm. It is no doubt uh, it will be approved to put inside the paper, and we will huh. set aside one page or two pages with color, and definitely online because real estate online is infinity. Yeah. So yeah. it just has to be smart uh, and visually um, 
amazing. So in closing, uh, you mentioned when you were starting out, this is right before going to Vibe, but do you have any advice for yourself if you were, if you could go back in time and tell yourself, you know, Leslie, definitely don't do this or definitely do more of that. Is there anything that you'd, you'd tell yourself if you had to start it all over again, or are you pretty happy with, uh, the path that things have taken thus far? I, I know that this might sound like BS, but I'm so, I'm so happy the way things have turned out. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I, well, I was going to say the one thing that I, I might've told myself is it took me 10 years to graduate Mm -hmm. uh, from college because I had, I'd gone part time. I was traveling. Yeah. Um, I think that may be one of the things I would have told myself is, you know, hurry up and get your degree so you can go about your business and, and work start earlier. Mm-hmm. But actually, you know what? Delete all of that shit. <laughs> because every day I am thankful the way things have been. Yeah. Th- how things have transpired. And I, I seriously cannot say to myself that I would have told myself, I would have given this kind of advice because the advice I would have given myself was stay on the right course. And that's exactly what I have been doing. Yeah. I've been so fucking lucky (laughs) and I've been so grateful that my life has turned the way it has. I've had the most amazing opportunities in my career and, and in, and my life personally. And I, this is going to be sounding kind of crazy, but every Sunday I take a minute and I sort of, I, every Sunday at around seven, I take a minute and I thank the powers that be that my life has been going so well. Mm. Why, I'm going to knock on wood, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that my life, I'm so grateful for what I have. And I don't think I would have changed it in any way because I'm, I'm at the New York Times uh, and I've worked at Rolling Stone and I've worked at Time Magazine. And these are the three places when I was in high school that I wanted to work at and I am working at, I've worked at all three. That's insane. So it is a little, it's a little nutty, but yeah. I, I am really grateful. And I think that if I changed my life in any other way that I wouldn't have had those opportunities. So I'm just hashtag grateful. <laughs> That's the perfect ending. Hashtag grateful. <laughs> that is the best possible way to, to wrap this up. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I genuinely appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure you had a list of other things you'd rather be doing on a Sunday afternoon. No, so. no, Chip, you this know, is awesome. I, no, I really, really enjoy these kinds of chats. Yeah, me too. Um, only be- because I really do think that I, I really do think it's important for photographers today mm-hmm. uh, to know what to expect and what they can do to make themselves better. Because in reality, that makes my job better yep if you know and i want to be able to sort of share that um and hoping that i i could that's why i love doing these sort of student talks and having classrooms come through Mm -hmm. it's just so helpful and uh i'm very grateful for you and and thankful for for you to ask me to do this so well i appreciate it excited about it it's uh yeah being a photographer sometimes can be a solitary uh pursuit so getting to talk to you know uh professionals that are as accomplished as you are it's just so nice to sort of hear that you know we are uh we're on the we're on the right path and what to do and what not to do and and how to think about things and how to approach things i think it just sort of the rising tide floats all boats i hope so i really appreciate you i think you're doing a great thing so thank you very much fantastic so where can we find you if um people want to keep up with you and maybe what you're shooting and if you uh yeah uh, the best way would be the instagram account that usually so it's leslie.delavega okay my instagram account and that will tell you what uh what i've been doing professionally as far as my work at the times Mm -hmm. also what i'm doing personally uh i also have like photographer referrals on there if there's some shoots that i find or some images that i find that are really out of this world i'll put it up um i really do everything through my instagram account and there's some personal things i put on there too like the skiing yeah um, that i was really excited about i was using a gopro for the first time nice um so things like that. I can also be reached at leslie.delavega at nytimes.com. Okay. Um, and that's it. And I have a website, so leslie.delavega.com. Thank you, Leslie. 
Thank you so much, Chip. I had a great time. Thank you. Okay, guys, so that about wraps up the show for today. But I just want to say thank you very much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And if you like what you heard, please spread the word. You can find the show on social media at North Podcast. And if you want to hit me up, feel free to do so as well. I am just at Chip Galbeck. And if you wouldn't mind taking just a minute to leave a review, subscribe to the show, tell a friend, that's always appreciated as well. So thanks again. And until next time.